Good afternoon and Happy New Year. Welcome back to my channel. I'm glad you're here. I already covered my top jazz reissues of 2023. Now I wanted to cover, I am going to cover, my top new jazz reissues. Records that have never been available before. Some of these are even, even older recordings that are now available on vinyl. So this covers a pretty wide array starting with John Sinclair presents Detroit Artist Workshop, Community Jazz and Art in the Motor City, 1965 to 1981. Put it out on the Strut Art Yard label. Now, I am from Detroit, so I found this really fascinating. I think I found this at Stranded Records. I can't remember if we had it at the store at Jazz Records Center where I work one day a week. Uh, but this is fascinating. It's uh, Donald Byrd, Benny Maupin, Charles Moore, Ron English. Lyman Woodard, Teddy Harris, and these were live radio shows uh, broadcast by the DJ John Sinclair in Detroit from 65 to 81. And you really get a sense of the vibrancy of the music, uh, such tracks as Donald Byrd, Cristo Redentor, Donald Byrd, Blackjack, the Detroit Contemporary Five with Stanley Cowell, Benny Maupin Quartet, Water Torture, Ron English, Bees, Teddy Harris, Passion Dance, so you really, it's like being there essentially. The sound is a radio broadcast and I thought it was more than adequate. Excellent liner notes, a two LP set. Can't remember what I paid for this. Um, K7, manufactured in po Poland, assembled in the Czech Republic. So if you're one for, you know, this isn't really, I mean, it's civil rights era, but it's also leading to a different era of uh, the, I guess what you might call the black justice movement, for lack of a better term. But this is just really a, a very vibrant recording uh, that I think anyone into these artists would really love. Next up we have on the JMI label, Lage Lund, I believe is how you produce his name, a Norwegian jazz guitarist, and his trio that includes Matt Brewer and Tishine Sari on drums. This is a beautiful jewel of a record. There he is playing his, what it looks to be a custom hollow body electric guitar. Um, he has a really beautiful shimmering, I want to say gentle sound on the guitar, really rich. Uh, very much a glowing sound and these are very interpretive uh, tunes if you want to call it that. Arado, Ashes, Everything Means Nothing to Me, Bobby's Tune, Vashkar, Tipsy Turvy, and La Aurelio Del Mundo. I don't know if that Vashkar is the, but copyright Carla Blay. There you go. Uh, but it's really beautiful. They don't, there's Occasionally they swing, but really this is just interpretive bar by bar by bar bar, just really serpentine and intertwining. It's very much a tapestry. These are, uh, particularly Brewer and Shory, are two of the busiest musicians in New York. Matt Brewer is playing with everybody now. Taishan Shory went from being sort of an avant-garde wunderkind to taking over Anthony Braxton's chair at Wesley, and now he's on to some other university. He's what you believe I believe you call it polymath, and he can swing his ass off. But there's no traditional swing here. This is in the moment, bar by bar, just weaving. It's very adventurous, as I said, very serpentine, and it really washes over you. It's a really beautiful recording, and the three of them are highly improvisational and highly interactive. On JMI, I forgot what I paid for this, but um, a beautiful record. What's it called? Ashes, Lage Lund. Mm -hmm. 
Next up, the Schutein Erdenbauer Quartet, Rising Sun. On the, what label is this? Oh, it's on Motima, a very well-known jazz label. Uh, this is interesting. The last two records are Northeastern records. Lage Lunda is recorded here in New York, and it has that sound of New York. But this is cut out in California, so the sound is a little, the overall vibe is a little more tranquil, a little more adventurous. I hear touches of Chick Corea in her composition and some of her piano work. But these are all her compositions, her arrangements, um, and she has a brilliant quartet. I was really knocked out by uh, drummer Valentin Renner and soprano and alto saxophonist Anton Mangold, Nils Kugelman on bass, and they really play like a band. This isn't a pickup session. I doubt these people are reading charts because it is really tight and it just flows. Some of it flows, you know, it's California. So sometimes it's, it's like a mountain stream sound. I don't mean to be a, have a cliche, but it's, it's really beautiful and just flows and it's really tight. It's super dynamic. They explore all different sorts of rhythms. Um, they go into straight ahead occasionally, but primarily it's more sort of, I don't want to use the word gentle, but I'll use the word gentle while being very fast at times, and uh, they definitely cover a lot of ground. A fresh new voice on the piano, Schutin Erdenbotter, Quartet, Rising Sun. This next record doesn't come out until January 19th. Mary Halverson, Cloudward. Now, if you follow her at all, she's a uh, New York based guitarist, just a, a brilliant guitarist, a totally unique and original voice, which at, which at first glance or listen sounds very much inspired by Metallica or Black Sabbath because she uses a lot of really heavy riffing sounds. She has a full array of uh, pedals that act like a whammy bar and does all these insane sounds that she comes up with um, and her previous records she's made quite a few are definitely more featuring that guitar sound of hers you know just knocking you down uh, but this is a much more this is written for her ensemble Adam O'Farrell on trumpet Jacob Garchik on trombone Mary Halverson on guitar Pat Patricia Brennan on vibraphone Nick Dunstan on bass Thomas Fujiwara on drums it's sort of a regular drummer and man, this is just, her writing style has changed. To me, it's more complete and full. And this album is full of all these thumbnail-like sketches of small suites that the band veers into and veers out of, led by her guitar. But the focus is not on her guitar. It's really on her compositions. And just with all her earlier records that kind of take you by shock at first, this one really stays with you just the aura of the music if there's a there's definitely a, a floating feeling it's funny it's called cloud word it's on non such by the way um, and Laurie Anderson plays violin on one track um, but there's definitely a feeling of floating from cloud to cloud to cloud and they go down all these unusual paths everyone takes brief solos and some amazing solos and the way the solos change changes the color of each place they're going within her music and uh, how many tracks are there? One, two, three, four, like six tracks. And she's really just growing as a composer. And I hate to say this at times, sounds like chamber jazz, but there's definitely a modern contemporary classical element to it. But really it's just about this beautiful floating in and out of different sort of meters and groupings and ideas really. And her guitar is like the glue that pulls everything together. Her guitar can sound like a, like a bird at times, or imagine a bird cooing and with a whammy bar on it, just kind of floating through things. Anyway, an amazing record um, and a crazy cover as well. Mary Halverson, Cloudward. <laughs>
Next up, Kendrick Scott, Corridors, with Ruben Rogers on bass and Walter Smith III on tenor. This is on Blue Note. Kendrick Scott is one of the great young, I think he might be in his 30s, drummers working today. He came out of the whole Houston scene where there are so many great drummers, the whole gospel chops and church drummers. Um, he is the current drummer with Charles Lloyd's group. And this is a uh, this is a trio record. I asked him why he did a trio. He said, well, nobody else is, so I wanted to do a trio. And there are many different moves on this record. It's not just a simple head, swing, bridge. Um, there's some deep explorations here. There's some deep ruminations going on here. A couple tunes almost sound like sort of floating requiems to a degree within a three piece, if you can say that. Uh, within that framework, um, Scott plays mallets, brushes, um, sticks to get all these different effects. He's a very thoughtful drummer. I saw him play a few years ago at a bar out in Brooklyn, and he, I forgot the name of the uh, electronic drums he was playing, but he had programmed a speech by Philandro, Phil, Philando Castile. I'm just pronouncing his name. But it's the 911 call from his wife. And it's the way he set it up and broke it up and played drums along with it was just incredibly powerful. Uh, that just blew my doors out. You can find it on YouTube. Just search for Kendrick St Scott Philando, Philandro, I believe, Castile. And uh, so he's a very deep, thoughtful guy. He actually brought this album over to my house uh, when he had the test pressings to hear it on my stereo because I have a crazy rig here. Um, but I love the way he plays. He's got incredible control, uh, velocity, technique. He can jump in a heartbeat. And th throughout different parts of this record, it really reminded me of Sonny Rollins at the Village Vanguard. Um, just the down and the sort of cut nature of it. Uh, even though there is a bass player, well, there's Wilbur Ware on Live at the Village Vanguard, but um, it's really a saxophone drum kind of duet at times. And it's really beautiful, and they cover a wide range of styles. And I don't think he gets enough credit. Um, there's an upcoming Blue Note super group that's going to go out called Blue Note All Stars that will start touring in the new year, which will be Joel Ross on vibraphone, Emmanuel Wilkins on sax. I forget who the bass player is, but Kendrick Scott is the drummer. So I'm hoping to interview them for Stereophile. Anyway, great record if you can find it. Kendrick Scott Corridors on Blue Note. <laughs> This next record is by a tenor player, a friend of mine in the city named Jerome Sabag, in, or Sabah, I don't know how you pronounce it. This is his album, Vintage. He's French. And this album very much is titled correctly. This sounds like Lester Young and Lucky Thompson had a baby. Um, it's just beautifully played. Kenny Barron on piano, Joe Martin on bass, the great Jonathan Blake on drums. This is just a really sweet, mellow, relaxed session um, and it's even recorded old school with the saxophone on the left channel and uh, I guess the bass in the middle of the piano on the right but man it's beautiful they, two tunes by Monk we see and ask me now and this is just the mellowest jazz record of the year I saw his trio play at the power station the recording studio where they had a uh, event for a new speaker launch and he played with um, Joe Martin and um, Kush Abadeh, another great drummer, and it was just so, this record just kind of unfurls and floats over you and makes you slow down. And Drome has such a beautiful sound. When I first started listening to it, I thought, man, this album's really dull, it's kind of sleepy. But the more I put it on, it slowed me down. In New York, you gotta slow down sometimes. But beautiful pacing, beautiful ensemble work, and you get the extra added bonus of the great Kenny Barron, who's now one of the latter-day greats still playing in jazz. Jerome Seba Vintage on Sunnyside, one of the perennially perennial perennial great jazz labels. <laughs> Next 
next up, a left turn back to the West Coast. The keyboard player Re Rachel Eckroth and her album Humanoid on Sam First. Sam First is a really cool label out of LA. They have a recording studio basically set up in a live venue and they record everything live. And the results are mixed. Some of the records sound better than others. There's this one, there's another one called Clam City uh, that just came out with her husband, Tim LaFave on bass and the great Mark Giuliano on drums. Um, they've also done a Joe LaBarber record, which I thought was really great. But this is one of the most recent ones. Rachel Eckler on piano, Andrew Renfro on guitar, Billy Moeller on acoustic bass, and Tina Raymond on drums. You know, I've made the comment that sometimes LA jazz doesn't have the heat or the friction or the fission of New York jazz. And I generally think that's true. It's a different place to live. Every part of the, the country expresses the region. It's funny, back in the old days before radio was corporatized, when I was a little tiny kid, I would stay up late at night and go through all the AM dials because different parts of the country would play different music, different singles. You'd have regional hits in each part of the country. I don't think that's true anymore. I could be wrong. It's all corporate radio now. But this album sort of turns that on its head because these are all her compositions, Rachel Eckroff, um, Humanoid. And she, her composition and her playing is very sparse, sort of monk-like for a lazy descriptor. And Andrew Renfrew is a, a brilliant guitarist. He's on the, on the uh, Mike Deruba record. I interviewed Mike recently. And Billy, I have a Billy album coming up as well. And this is, and they're playing jazz. You know, they stretch out, it's all very sparse. There's a lot of room, it's very spatial, but I mostly really enjoyed her compositions, the melodies, because they're just kind of unusual. It's kind of, he's, there's even a little Joe Zawinul there from Weatherport in a way, not, not literally, but in the feeling of the whole thing. Some of the very latter period Weatherport stuff, but she's only playing piano, there's no sense. So it's a very different kind of sound, very spacious. And uh, I really dug it, Rachel Eckroth, Humanoid. <laughs> London Brew. Now this album came out on Concord Jazz, I think pretty much the beginning of last year. It's a two LP set and they call it London Brew. I think they're kind of sparking off Bitches Brew. These are all the cream of the crop UK jazz players and for my money the jazz coming out of the UK right now is just really really exciting because they incorporate so many influences and they're not beholden to learning the US wrote way of playing jazz. So they bring in drum and bass, they bring in electronic stuff like Yusuf Days, I think is kind of a drum and bass drummer. They bring in music from uh, Trinidad and Tobago and the Caribbean and South Africa, and it's really amazing. But this is uh, a big group, Dave Akumo on guitar, Martin Tereffi on guitar, Nubia Garcia, perhaps the biggest name here on saxophone, Benji B. Dex, Sonic Recycling, See, they're, they're willing to take stuff and mess with it electronical, which is like Bitches Brew. He took the tapes and Tio Macero messed with the tapes to come up with something new. I believe Silent Way was done that way as well. Nicholas Ram on piano, Nicolaj Torp Larson on synthesizers, Raven Bush on violin and electronics. There's a lot of electronics here. Tom Herbert on electric bass, Theon Cross on tuba, Tom Skinner from the group Smile on drums and percussion. And this is just four sides, double LP, of incendiary burning improvisation but it goes all over the place as i've stated before when i reviewed some of the stuff that's coming out of london a lot of it reminds me of bill laswell's label which i can't remember the name of he's got a few labels alas no access is that one of them but it very much sounds like that because bill laswell took what miles was doing at the end and brought in contemporary players across jazz across metal and kind of created something new and they're doing the same thing and this is just a, uh, you know, deep in the cut, grinding, grooving, spatial, experimental, all over the place kind of record. A lot of fun and crazy artwork on uh, Concord. Concord Jazz, London Brew. <laughs>
I mentioned I have a record by Billy Moeller. This is on Contagious Music, that label. The album is called Ultra Ultraviolet with members of the band Kneebody. Another, I don't think they're really LA based. I don't know anymore. Chicago, LA, Nate Wood, the drummer's in New York. Shane Ensley, also the trumpet player, I believe, is from LA. Right, and Chris Speed, formerly a New York guy on saxophone. This is a, uh, <clears throat> I asked Billy what the, what the uh, influence was on his melodies, because these melodies are all very catchy, but not in a happy way. This is music, some of this music is forlorn, it's very physical, it's very muscular, not in kind of a macho way, just in the stability and the physicality of the, uh, of the melodies, and everyone improvises off those. But Billy told me in a recent email that, you know, he didn't have a happy childhood growing up. His father uh, projected <clears throat> wealth and strength when they were actually in financial straits all the time. So that put a lot of stress into his life. And the melodies on this record, I wouldn't call them stressful, but there is trouble and, and they're forlorn, uh, which is unusual. Unlike the Schutein Ertenbotter record, which is more tranquil and joyous in places, there's none of that here. But that gives the music a lot of weight and a lot of depth. And these musicians are fantastic. Nate Wood is a well-known uh, mixing engine here near here in the city. He also does a great thing. I think he calls himself Four, where he plays bass on this hand, keyboards with this hand, and drums in between. He's the most advanced uh, one-man band I've ever seen. But this is a really... It's a dark record, you know? There's physicality to it and weight, and they go through a lot of different time feels. It swings in places, but it's not really about that. But I just really enjoyed it for the, sort of the darkness, the physicality of the melodies, and the playing is so brilliant. And it's not an LA record, it's not a New York record. I guess it is an LA record, but it's with New York cats, so it's kind of weird. But I really dug it, you should check it out. Billy Moeller, who is the bassist, Ultraviolet. Almost on the opposite tack, again from the UK, the trumpeter Matthew Halsall, an ever-changing view. <clears throat> He's made about 10 records now, and they're all very similar in a way. You know, and I think initially I thought, oh, this is uh, spiritual jazz. This is some new spiritual jazz. And the back cover has this beautiful engraving of the song titles, the double LP set. But he really has his own thing. It's almost like it's very peaceful, very meditative. It's easy to get caught up in this music. Uh, it's very calming, uh, but there is some sturdiness to it, and there is weight, and he has a beautiful trumpet sound, and he's one of the most consistent guys out of the UK scene. I believe he's from London. I don't think he's Australian, but this is on his Gondwana label. Beautiful cover, and the, uh, the inner artwork is equal, equally beautiful with different takes on that same cover, but I can't find it. But if you know his work and you like his previous work, you'll definitely dig this. Matthew Halsall, an ever-changing view. Back to JMI Records, Helen Sung with Marquise Hill. Helen Sung, brilliant pianist. Marquise Hill, brilliant trumpet player from Philadelphia. And this is just a beautiful duet record. Um, and they both really get to shine. This is called Everybody's Waltz. You know, if you're a hi-fi person, piano is one of the main things you use to see if your system will play naturally. Because the piano has such a broad range tonally, percussively. Um, you don't want it to sound like it's metal. You want everything to have 
lushness and tone uh, without being syrupy, of course. And this is a really great recording. JMI is, I think, an audiophile label. On the back of every record, they state the, the gear they use. Recorded to RTM 2-inch tape on a Studer A800 MK3. Mixed down to ATR half tape, half inch tape, <clears throat> on an Ampex ATR 102. Those are state of the art, going back 60 years, well, 60 years, 40 years, tape machines. Mastered by Scott Hull in Peekskill, New York. So if you want just something a little different, not the usual drums and bass and group banging you over the head, this is a beautiful recording. Um, and they cover the range of emotions, the range of, range of styles, and they both really get to shine. I wonder who thought this idea up, because he's a, a brilliant up-and-coming pianist. She's been around a while, rather trumpeter on him, so it's a great idea for these two. I'd love to see more things like this. Also from JMI, one of my favorite records of the year, hands down, Antero Sievert, Dear Bassa. What an amazing record this is. It's Afro-Cuban, it's Brazilian, it's uh, Afro-Caribbean, it has unusual instrumentation. There's a, a woman who plays, well for one thing there's a lot of flute, which I've complained in the past, nobody plays flute anymore in modern jazz ensembles. Here we have flute, we have Edmar Castaneda playing the arpa Lanera, which is a small harp. So already you're, you're dealing with all these really unusual textures and the compositions really pulled me in and made me listen. Right when I thought they were gonna go one place, they went some other place. There's the group on the back. And the cover is also quite uh, shocking. I, I exchanged some emails with him. I should have asked him why an old typewriter? An image like, like that to me speaks of craft and heritage and tradition and also old technology. Uh, there's not a lot, of, a lot of technology on this record. It's piano, percussion, flute. Well, that's not true. The Antero Seifert plays a wide range of, of keyboards. The Yamaha CX-7, Fender Rhodes, a Wurlitzer, a Clavinet, a Prophet 5, a Mini Moog synthesizer, Roland RS-101 string synthesizer, but everything is so tastefully done. And man, it's just a great, pond to jump into because there's so much depth and different rhythms happening and unusual textures with from the flute to the roads to the harp it's just a, a brilliant very very original record really excited to to get this looking forward to his next work so i think he is working on something new now and taro sievert dear bossa on jmi <laughs> I've often tried to, not often, a few times tried to explain the easiest way to get into free jazz. And for me, it's just sitting back, whether it's Milford Graves or John Coltrane or Ornette Coleman. Ornette Coleman's really not free jazz. If you listen to his first records now, it sounds like folk music. But, you know, some Archie Shep, um, stuff like Charles Tyler that I can't get with. But Matthew Shipp, I think, is a perfect example of accessible free jazz. Now, this album was recorded in 1990. Matthew Ship Trio Circular Temple with the great William Parker on bass and Whit Dickey on drums. Special thanks to Mr. and Mrs. Matthew Ship, Elliot Lloyd, and Henry Rollins. I don't like that. But anyway, um, this is the latest disc from ESP. And uh, if you want to hear state of the art free jazz, I don't even like that word. It's creative improvisation without borders or without rules. I mean, there are rules. These guys learn the rules, absorb the rules, then go past the rules to create something really beautiful. 
he, you know, you put this record on and just listen to his piano and you get taken away. He comes up with these most brilliant ideas and flourishes. It's very epic in a way, but still very relatable. I love his piano playing. I don't know who did the cover art, but a uh, something worth checking out if you want to get into free jazz. Matthew Ship, Circular Temple on ESP. <laughs> a couple of record store day releases in here because these have never been out on record before so to me they're new starting with Bill Evans Tales live in Copenhagen 64 on resonance this is easily easily one of the best of these many 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 Bill Evans reissues that Zev Feldman has put out and he told me in a recent interview they're done there is no uh, Bill Evans coming out they put out like 10 of these things but this has this is a double, the single LP, which is kind of amazing considering Zeb puts out like three and four LPs. And they were so expensive, are so expensive. But this has Bill Evans, Chuck Israels, and Larry Bunker on one side, and Bill Evans, Eddie Gomez, and Marty Morell bonus track on the second side. And they do all the classic tunes, Waltz for Debbie, My Foolish Heart, How My Heart Sings, I Didn't Know What Time It Was, Around Midnight, and man, this is a beautiful recording. That's one of those state-of-the-art you know, cut in a Denmark recording studio, like the BBC, where one day they would do operas, the next day they're doing a rock band, and they're doing jazz, so they have to be ready for all circumstances, and man, this is a beautiful recording. It's so crisp and clean, but has plenty of weight, and uh, Bill Evans' Tales live in Copenhagen. I think people have gotten a little tired of buying these really expensive record store day things. I know, man, a beautiful Bill Evans record. Everything you love about Bill Evans is on this rec is on this record. The lyricism, the depth, the beauty, the brilliant soloing covers all the bases. <laughs> That same vein, Cal Jader, Catching Groove, live at the Penthouse 1963-1967. I think there are going to be many of these Penthouse recordings from Zeb Feldman. This is on the Jazz Detective label and Elemental. This is one, this is three LPs. This could have been a really great single LP or maybe a two LP set because each side starts out with what I think of as a standard and it's kind of like they're playing something for the audience that anybody can comprehend. But then, halfway through each side, they start burning and playing real Afro-Cuban. And the lineup on this thing is great. Cal Jader on Vibes, the great Amanda Peraza on Conga and Bongo. Carl Burnett later on with uh, drums and timbales. Monk, Monk Montgomery on bass on one track. Uh, and like I said, like the side A starts with Take the A Train in Your Own Sweet Way, It Never Entered My Mind. And the last two tunes are Afro-Cuban. Side B, Sunset Boulevard, here's that rainy day. And then a Cal Jader tune, another Cal Jader tune, a Paul Horn tune. So you really get to hear the magic of Cal Jader in his uh, element. You know, he made a lot of great records. I think at one time he was the best selling artist on fantasy to where they had to, they basically created their own, his own label. And you really get to hear how great he is. You know, he made shit tons of records but they're all really hard to find now. I mean, when you do find them, they're pretty cheap because people don't really care, except for the really early fantasy things. But this is a really great taste of Cal Jader, worth searching out, and I imagine it's a lot cheaper now than it was on Record Store Day. <laughs> Thank you. 
finally, you know him, you love him, but there's very hard to find a good recording of him. Charlie Parker, Bird, perhaps one of the most important people, along with Dizzy Gillespie, in the beginnings of the music we think of as hard bop. Now, they played bebop, which led to hard bop, but this is a wonderful example of Charlie Parker playing in a large group situation. Anyway, here's to a great 2024. I appreciate you watching. If you would please like and subscribe so I can keep doing this. And I was thinking the other day, why do I do this? I live in a small apartment. It's hard to set things up. Um, but I really just do it because I really love jazz. It's very important music to me. Uh, I was a jazz drummer for many years. I read about jazz. Well, I still do for Downbeat occasionally and Jazz Times. And this is American classical music, I hate to put it that way, but along with the blues, rock and roll, and hip hop, this is America's own music. Watching. Uh, if you want to check out my Jazz Vinyl Lovers group on Facebook, we're up to 13,000 members. I really appreciate your support, and Happy New Year!